Legend of War here, and today we're doing another Legendary Lord comparison guide, this time covering the Dwarves. So I'll be ranking all five of their Legendary Lords based on three key criteria. Their battle power, how good they are personally in combat. Command power, how good they are at boosting their entire army. And their faction power, how good they are at boosting their entire faction with global bonuses. But I do need to let you guys know that this comparison guide is sponsored by Manscaped. Now, as somebody that works from home and doesn't exactly get out a lot, um, I'm oftentimes walking around the house with uh, less than new clothes. Quite often, the pants that I wear just have holes through them. So that doesn't really give a big buffer zone between the outside world and my smelly junk. So using the Manscaped product, allows me to wear the clothes that I find comfortable around the house without my wife having to pinch her nose every single time I walk past. So that's my personal testicle money on that. But we've also got some of your guys' testicle monies that you posted on the previous one. So I'm going to read out some of them. So we got one here. Welp, I can't deny an endorsement like that. Time to shave the old boys smoother than Mazda Mundy's great jiggling gut. I own the plow, their double-edged safety razor. Keeping my bald head clean is easy with it. I don't use Manscaped 3.0 to shave my smooth criminals because my lady likes the hair for whatever reason. But it's absolutely amazing when I hop into the shower, get my legs up in the air, and go to town clearing away the beard from my leather donut. I use the razor blades and let me tell you, nothing hurts more than cutting up my brown starfish while trying to deforest my Mariana's trench. What? Uh, so when my lady brought me the Lawnmower 3.0, it was pretty life-changing. I haven't nicked my asshole since. That's, that's such a good image. That was actually too much of a testicle money, but thanks, dude. Little known Warhammer facts. If you manscape a beastman, he becomes a lizardman. And if you manscape a dwarf, you get your name in a book. Yep, and I'm gonna have my name put in the book many times in this video. I'm a kid in college who has been mainly using scissors, but I bought it a while back and I have never looked back. Great little product that does a damn good job. These adverts for Manscaped are better than your actual content. I came for Total War and stayed to shave my nuts. Okay, that's great. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. Anyway, with that being said, I appreciate all the support that you guys have given for these sponsored videos. Now let's talk about the actual comparison guide. Starting with number 5. Taking the number 5 spot on the bottom of this list goes to Ungram Iron Fist, which I'm sure is going to put me in the book. Whatever, that's fine. But... Based on the criteria that I've set out, Ungram Iron Fist did receive the lowest score out of the five Legendary Lords. Now, in the past, I've put Ungram Iron Fist in the bottom five Legendary Lords in the entire game. Now, I no longer feel like that is the case. He's gone up a little bit in there, but he's nowhere near the best Dwarf Legendary Lord, not even close. So, let's evaluate him starting with his battle power. Now, he's actually going to get a 10 out of 10 for this, because this is where he's going to get most of his power. He's very good at fighting. He's unbreakable, his stats are incredible just at the start of the campaign, not to mention by the time you get all of his equipment and get some character runes, including a rune of spite, he can essentially take on most single entity characters no problem, and kill huge amounts of infantry without any difficulty at all. So in terms of a melee legendary lord, he's one of the best in the game, but that's only one of the three criteria. He has to hit high marks in all three criteria in order to get a good score. So 10 out of 10 for battle power. In terms of command power, he's going to get an 8 out of 10. I know what you're thinking, a 10 out of 10 and an 8 out of 10? What could go wrong? He must surely... How is he at the bottom of this list, right? Well, there's still more to come. So he's going to get an 8 out of 10 because he does provide a lot of boosts to Slayers. If Slayers were actually a like great unit, then it would be higher. But the thing is... Even with all of the boosts to Slayers, they're still inferior to the regular Dwarven armies at like balanced builds. And Slayers just don't do that well at supporting artillery. Slayers just sort of die too quickly. So being able to reduce upkeep cost by 25%, increase their melee attack. The passive ability Journey's End used to be a lot better when it was at 50% health. They'd actually start dying, but now it's only at 75%, which doesn't really make that big of a difference. So they significantly nerfed Journey's End. I feel like it should be more along the lines of 60%. I feel like that would be better for for uh, Ungram Iron Fist, and he's got a bunch of bonuses over here uh, with Slayers, extra melee attack, uh, extra bonus versus large, just really good bonuses for Slayers. It's just that Slayers themselves are not the best Dwarf units, but they're good in emergencies, so you certainly can make Ungram Iron Fist a good Slayer meme stack, um, but it's not going to get a 10 out of 10 for command power in terms of that. Now this is where um, 
Ungrim really starts to fall down is his faction power. He's only going to get a 3 out of 10 because he doesn't do anything. There are no global bonuses with Ungrim Iron Fist that he provides. So that's just where he falls down compared to the other uh, Dwarf Legendary Lords. One, one might say he's uh, falling a little bit short in that regard. So overall, Ungrim Iron Fist is going to get a 7 out of 10. So he's a good fighter as a Legendary Lord, good to be hired in an emergency, but I wouldn't have him commanding any sort of standard Dwarf armies for the most part. Anyway, let's now move on to number 4. Taking the number 4 position goes to Thorak Ironbrow, which I think is probably going to confuse quite a lot of people because Thorak Ironbrow is the new kid on the block, and in my opinion, he's very much overhyped. But I think a lot of what people think is good about Thorak Ironbrow is actually what's good about Ironbrow's Expedition. Ironbrow's Expedition is definitely the strongest dwarf faction because of all of the uh, unique um, ancestor items that you can get from it, but that is not unique to Thorak Ironbrow. If you're playing as Karaza Karak and you confederate Thorak Ironbrow, you don't get access to that. That being said, if you're playing as Thorax Ironbrow and you confederate Karaza Karak, those characters then get access to those unique items. So it has a lot to do with Ironbrow's expedition. So let's evaluate Ironbrow just on his own. In terms of battle power, we're going to give him a 10 out of 10, which is equal to Ongrim Iron Fist. Uh, he's not as good in melee, but what he makes up for is his rune magic. He's arguably the best runesmith in the game. Now, in my opinion, rune magic actually took a bit of a nerf in the latest patch. What they did was they made rune magic more interesting, but actually less powerful. Because what you used to be able to do was cast all of your runes just constantly, right? But now because of the way the cooldown works is that you can really only cast one rune at a time and you're constantly checking to wait for those runes to cool down and some of the runes actually got a nerf, especially the rune of negation. It used to be an area of effect rune and uh, now it's just a single entity target. So it, it could have affected multiple units now it only affects one and it has a longer cooldown. Uh, the rune of wrath and ruin, while it's very useful in a siege, siege situations are not really important for like boosting the dwarfs at because they they were already good at sieges. Uh, yeah, you can use the Rune of Wrath and Ruin to take out an entire garrison if you're patient enough, but you really don't need to. Where the dwarfs really needed some power was on the battlefield, on a field battle, especially against greenskins in the early stages. And in many ways, the dwarfs got that, but not with rune magic. Now, in addition to his rune magic and his melee capabilities, the reason, main reason why he's going to get a 10 out of 10 is because of this ability here, the Runic Talismans, giving him a Rune of Spite, not as an item, but just as a passive, so it doesn't even take up a character slot, making him into a Mortis Engine, and then also with Clad Brakak, he's able to cast down um, Uranon's Thunderbolt, essentially, uh, once every 30 seconds, which is really useful. You can essentially make Thorak Ironbrow a one-man Doomstack if you can keep up his uh, ward save and give him some regen with, like, a um, Iron Warden Tankard or something. So, in combat, Thorak Ironbrow is extremely powerful. Now, his command power, he's also going to get a 9 out of 10, which is, again, a really high score, because he does a lot of stuff for his army, mainly with Quarrelers. If we have a look at Proven Tools, he's able to give armor-piercing missile damage plus 50% for quarreler units and among other things but main thing is for quarrelers not to mention he also provides extra armor-piercing weapon damage for his entire army just because of his trait so thorax ironbrow pretty much no matter what you decide to build in his army because you know building monsters isn't really an option for thorax uh, unless you get that um, bound carnosaur but that's only one unit and doesn't have to be in his army um, you're going to have loads of infantry units, so the armor-piercing weapon damage, even if you've just got Quarrelers, it's still going to be quite handy, especially for auto-resolve, which is what a lot of Dwarf players do tend to prioritize, because Dwarfs are very powerful in auto-resolve. So, in terms of building him a good Quarreler army, which is totally viable, um, yeah, he's going to get a 9 out of 10, but they're not the Dwarf's best units, which is why I didn't give him a 10 out of 10. The armor-piercing weapon bonuses for the Quarrelers basically puts them on par with uh, Thunderers in terms of armor-piercing damage, while having the extra utility of extra range and arcing shots. But really the best unit in the uh, Dwarf roster, in my opinion, is the Organ Gun and the uh, Flame Cannon, and that's not something that he's really able to boost, not without specific runes. 
So that's why he's only getting a 9 out of 10. Now, in terms of faction power, this is where he lets the faction down the most because he's only going to get a 4 out of 10. Because he doesn't do much at all. The only thing he does with exacting standards is gives all hero actions a success chance plus 15% for runesmiths, which is fairly useful because runesmiths are able to damage the walls, essentially allowing for siege attackers. And uh, that can be quite useful for the Dwarves. So that's not bad at all. But I'm only going to score that one point. Because you're not really going to be doing that a whole lot throughout the campaign. And it's not that useful. Because you can usually have very high success chances with doing that. Without any levels up on the hero at all. So that's helpful but not essentially. So overall, Thorak Iron Prow is going to get a 7.6 out of 10. Giving him essentially 2 points higher than Ungrim. He's still a good Legendary Lord, because I consider 7 out of 10 to be sort of like the benchmark of that every Legendary Lord should sort of sort of hit to be average. And um, Thorak Iron Prow just, just steps over that bar a little bit. Good Legendary Lord, but unfortunately fairly low down on this list. Let's move down now to number 3. Taking the number 3 spot on this list, putting me in the Book of Grudges, goes to... Uh, Thorgrim Grudgebearer, because any Dwarf Legendary Lord that I rate and don't put at the number one spot uh, is immediately going to put my name in the uh, Book of Grudges. That's just how it works. So my name is going to be in the Book of Grudges four times because of this video. Fair enough. Anyway, Thorgrim Grudgebearer didn't meet the criteria to hit the number one spot, but he did get a fairly good score, so let's talk about that. In terms of his battle power, let's start with that, uh, he's going to get an 8 out of 10. He didn't score a 10 out of 10 because he's not as good at fighting as Ungrim Iron Fist. And he can't do any, like, massive amounts of area effect damage the way that Thorak Ironbrow does. Now, you can, of course, give him a Rune of Spite. But one thing I want to point out is that any item that can be given to any character shouldn't be taken into consideration. Unless they themselves get that passive in their own skill tree, the way that Thorak does. He doesn't actually need to use the Rune of Spite in order to do it, because he gets his own passively, right? It's the same thing where we don't rate every character as if they had the Sword of Cain, because every character can be a 10 out of 10 combatant if we give them the Sword of Cain. We should only rate them based on the stuff that they uniquely get, which is their unique stat line and their unique equipment. Anything else that you do with them, that's entirely up to you, and you can boost it from 10 out of 10 to 14 out of 10 or whatever it is that you want to rate them to. That's totally fine. But based on his equipment and his stats, he's going to get an 8 out of 10, because like I said, he's not the best at melee, in terms of, you know, better than Ungrim Iron Fist. He's not unbreakable. He's a large combatant, which means he's going to be more susceptible to getting hit more often because more entities will hit him at a time, and also more susceptible to being shot. Uh, whereas Ungrim Iron Fist, when he's in melee, it's virtually impossible to shoot him because he's just too small. He's too hard to hit. And he has, you know, almost infinite physical resistance. So, Thorgrim Grungebearer, good fighter, but only gets an 8 out of 10 for that. In terms of his command power, he's going to get a 7 out of 10. Primarily looking at his trait, the High King, he provides a lot of physical resistance for Hammerers units. Now the problem with Hammerers is that on very hard battle difficulty, which is what I rate these characters on, uh, Hammerers are by far not the best unit in the uh, Dwarf roster, even with the physical resistance. The best units in your roster are going to be artillery and missile units, just like with most other factions in this game. So that is organ guns, grudge throwers... Uh, flame cannons, great cannons, thunderers, quarrelers. Those are the those are the real meat of your army that's going to do all the damage dealing to inflict the army losses. But of course, you can't just recruit those units. You're going to need somebody to protect them because they can't usually dish out enough damage just on their own just before the enemy get there. Unless you're finding like half a stack. No, you're going to need somebody to defend them, and those people are either thanes or. Iron Breakers. Now the reason that Iron Breakers are better than Hammerers is because one thing, they have more armor, they have shields making them able to block um, small missile fire, and they've also got the bound missile attack enabling them to actually thin out lightly armored infantry units quite easily before they even get close, which is something that Hammerers can't do. Yes, Hammerers can dish out a lot of damage, probably more so than Iron Breakers, but the um, the Iron Breakers will hold out multiple times longer than a Hammerer unit will, allowing for the Thunderers and Organ Guns and whatever you have to absolutely shred the enemy army because they will not let anyone get close to the, the important missile units, unless it's like a flying unit, in which case the Hammerer wouldn't help either. Uh, he does have a couple of other things as well that uh, will boost his army. So he's got at least Elite Enforcer here, which reduces upkeep costs for Longbeards and Hammerers. You know, that's pretty good if you're going to get those units. Um, fire Support here gives extra ammunition for um, artillery units and extra missile strength by 6%. That's, that's not bad, it's not huge, but it's not too bad. Uh, you've also got reduced upkeep cost with the Great Book of Grudges, you know, 
five percent it's not too much um and then i think you get another five percent over here with the axe of grimnir so all of that's you know fairly useful but i think that's only worth about a seven out of ten now in terms of his faction power this is where thorgrim grudgebearer really shines he's going to get a 9 out of 10, because he does a lot for his faction. Looking in Ancient Bloodline here, going down this line here, we can see that he's able to increase the capacity for Thanes and also increase their recruit rank. That's very useful. Increase the capacity of Master Engineers, also very useful, while also reducing the hero action cost of Master Engineers, which isn't that useful because I don't use their actions that often, but blocking enemy armies can be very useful. And then over here, you can get extra research rate and hero capacity for runesmiths. That's pretty good. But the main benefit I think that Thorgrim Grudgebearer provides is with the Dragon Crown of Karaz, which provides a plus three global bonus to to public order or provinces which is very useful especially if you're playing on legendary difficulty because you're really going to want that public order to stop revolts and also to help your provinces grow faster because uh, the worse the public order the less you'll grow and growth is a huge problem for dwarfs so overall Thorgrim Grudgebearer is going to score an 8 out of 10 now if you're also wondering why I didn't rank these grudges here I don't really consider these grudges particularly valuable because leadership with dwarfs is I mean they're like lowest leadership unit is 8 and melee attack is also something that I don't really value because um, their important stats are missile damage and melee defense. And unfortunately, these grudges don't really do anything about that. It's not like missile, uh, melee attack is worthless. I just didn't rate it very highly, so it just wasn't really worth noting that much. Anyway, 8 out of 10 for Thorgrim. Let's move on now to number 2. Taking the number 2 spot on this list goes to Grumbrindle the White Dwarf, who was very close to getting the number 1 spot, but he fell a little bit short, you know. Dwarfs, you know how it is. They tend to fall a little bit short from expectations. Except for the number one guy, surprisingly. Anyway, so Grombrindle got a fair few updates with the Dwarf update, making him significantly better than he was prior, but he still isn't at the number one spot. Let's talk about his battle power at the moment. He's going to get a 10 out of 10, because he is pretty much exactly the same as Ungrim Iron Fist. In terms of his melee capabilities, his stats are slightly different, but pretty much the same value. He's a small dude who's unbreakable, who hits like a truck, very difficult to kill. He provides the exact same role as Ungrim in terms of melee, so he's going to get a 10 out of 10. He's very good at it, just as good as Ungrim. Uh, in terms of command power, this is where things get a little bit all over the place with um, Gron Brindle, but he's only going to get a 7 out of 10. His white dwarf uh, trait gives leadership for the entire army, which is definitely good, but it's not like dwarves need lots of leadership. Most of the time, even on legendary difficulty, dwarves are not going to really break unless they're like pretty much destroyed anyway, unless they've got a lot of terror routing stuff coming at them. But the extra 10 leadership is definitely good. Uh, reinforcement range, plus 50%, also good. Um, not essential, though. Um, getting extra campaign movement range from here, plus 15%, is definitely good. But we also need to take into consideration that he doesn't get the 10% one down here. So really, that's like an additional 5% over what other people would normally get. Uh, then he's got the Mighty Beard of Defense, which provides melee defense and armor-piercing weapon damage when defending, so not all the time, but that's still good. But it would be better if he got it all the time. Um, Mythical Longevity, that helps to just make him a better fighter, so that goes into the previous rating. Uh, this one over here, uh, Rouse the Engineers, giving missile strength, ammunition, and melee defense for Iron Drakes and War Machine units. So I think that counts as artillery and um, gyrocopters. All pretty good, because these are units you're definitely going to want to recruit. So extra ammunition and all, all of that. It's very useful. I don't think the melee defense is particularly good, but it will probably help a little bit in order resolve so that those particular units don't get nuked. So those of you who like order resolve based armies, uh, you'll love that stat, for sure. You know, I'm sure people are sick and tired of having their order resolve nuked in. Sorry, their artillery nuked in order resolve. And then over here, we got uh, Grimnir's resolve. Now, this is a really good ability. It's something that he, he got an update for from. Because he used to only get one of these, and it used to only provide Unbreakable. And now it provides extra melee defense, as well as Unbreakable. At least I'm fairly sure about that. And being able to do that five times in a, in a battle is very useful, especially if you've, you really need to hold the line. Like I said before, the most important stat for the Dwarf Infantry is actually melee defense because you want to slow down the rate at which you're taking damage so that your missile units can have more time to kill everything. So very useful there. And Age of Vengeance here. This is especially useful. You gain armor-piercing weapon damage, lose base weapon damage, and gain speed. So... The speed bonus plus 35%, that's a really weird one for the dwarfs. Because on one hand, 35% is huge, but 
no particular dwarf unit has a lot of speed except for gyrocopters, so that would really help gyrocopters move into like 130 speed or whatever. But like, you don't need dwarf warriors to move at 50 speed. You don't. You don't need. Uh, maybe the slayers. Maybe if you want to put slayers in his army, but I wouldn't do that. So dwarf armies are usually supposed to just dig in and just shoot them and just hold the line. So the extra speed is definitely cool, but not always useful, I think. Unless you can come up with some sort of gyrocopter doom stack. But still, a useful stat nonetheless. So, with that, yeah, he gets a 7 out of 10 for his command ability. There's a lot of, lot of good stuff in there, but nothing, like, incredible. At least compared to other 10 out of 10 command legendary lords. And then in terms of his faction power, uh, Grom Brindle is going to get a 9 out of 10 because he provides a ton for his faction all down here in his particular blue line But it's important to note that through his blue line here He does actually miss out on a his own replenishment So he gets um he gets get up over here, which provides casualty replenishment plus 6% all characters faction wide but a random Lord for example They've also got the Inspirational Leader, giving them 15%. So they get that 15% plus Grom Brindle's boost of additional 6%, getting them to 21%, but Grom Brindle only gets the 6%. So he actually has the lowest amount of replenishment out of any Dwarf Lord. So he actually loses points. This actually loses points in terms of his command power because he's missing a skill uh, that normally doesn't happen. Um, he's got Absolutely Relentless here, which is great. Extra campaign movement range plus 15% for all characters. This works into his faction capabilities. Extra recruit ranks over here. Um, recruitment cost and global recruitment. All of that's good. And he also provides income from trade plus 20%. It's all good stuff in there, which is why he's going to get a 9 out of 10. Very good Legendary Lord. He's going to score an 8.6 out of 10. He would have scored a little bit higher if he had Inspirational Leader because Dwarf re Replenishment is really a bit of a problem. And he basically shouldn't be going into any inhospitable territories. It should be some sending somebody else to do it because he just got the lowest Replenishment. Anyway, let's move on now to the number one spot on this list. Taking the number one spot on this list goes to Belagar Ironhammer, the Beggar King of the Dwarfs, part of the worst Dwarf faction in their race, uh, Clan Angrant is uh, the number one uh, legendary lord for their race. So, Belagar Ironhammer, let's talk about what makes him so good. In terms of his battle power, he's going to get an 8 out of 10. And saying that, I know that immediately, all dwarfs have now been disqualified from obtaining a 10 out of 10 legendary lord, which once again gets my name put in the Book of Grudges. Oh, well, I guess that's the fifth time. Fair enough. So yeah, he's only going to get an 8 out of 10 because there's no way he's on the same tier of uh, melee capabilities as Ungrim or Grombrindle because he's not unbreakable and he just doesn't inflict as much damage as them. Um, he is good at melee defense, good at holding the line for a long time. Uh, he's about on the same tier as Thorgrim Grudgebearer because while maybe not being quite as high as stats, he is smaller which actually gives him an advantage over Thorgrim because Thorgrim being larger will get hit more often. So Belagar would probably be a bit more defensive without having as much offense as Thorgrim. Giving him the Roughly the same score, giving him 8 out of 10. So I think that's a solid score for him. In terms of his command power, he's going to get a 9 out of 10. Now, there's there's a few wonky things with this to go over, but it's really talking about his maximum potential, what you can do with Belagar Ironhammer. And it really comes down to the idea that he's going to recruit rangers, specifically Bugman rangers, because he can get a lot of use out of them. So if we, we can look at some minor stuff, like like his uh, trait, True King of Eight Peaks, which gives Mighty O Stone and uh, extra leadership when fighting against Greenskins Escape and Siege Attacker. Siege Attacker is very useful, don't get me wrong. Um, and we'll play into this a bit, but the other ones, that, that's good and everything, but they're just buffs. Um, Tunnel Warfare will give uh, Rangers extra missile strength, give them extra melee attack and melee defense, as well as bolt throwers and miners, as well as the extra ammunition for miners. But I wouldn't prioritize those units for Belagar. It's up to you if you want to do that, um, but it's just not what I would prioritize. Uh, you really want to go ranger heavy with him because of what you can do with him. So the, the extra melee defense and melee attack and missile strength, very useful for rangers. And then ancestral guidance over here, if you don't want to listen to me at all and just want to do your own thing, then Physical resistance plus 10% for Lord's Army is insanely good. So Thorgrim was able to provide 15% just to Hammerers, and he's able to chuck in 10% to everyone. So it doesn't matter what unit you get. You want to get Iron Breakers? Iron Breakers with 10% physical resistance. Really useful. And especially useful being part of uh, Clan Angrind is that these Ancestor Heroes here, 
One way or another, Belagar is always going to have access to these guys here, whether you confederate him or not. Um, and these guys have 75% physical resistance. So if you put them in Belagar's army, they're going to have 85% physical resistance without any items on them, making them nearly impervious to physical weapons. Basically, you need ma magic attack in order to kill them. Very, very dangerous if he's got that. And um, Age of Conquest over here, giving him extra campaign movement range and the Shattering Aura during siege battles. Really good. But here's, here's what you really want to be doing with um, Belagar, right? You want to be going super heavy with uh, probably Bugman Rangers because they're missile attack that's good in melee and they also regen. They can't regenerate uh, entities uh, once they've died though. Then if you attach a Thane in the army... You've got Wanderer here, so you only need one of them to do this. It gives the attribute Snipe for Ranger units. Now, Rangers already stalk, so if they have Snipe, that means that they don't come out of being hidden when shooting. And the AI doesn't really react to when they're being shot by Sniped units. So if you've got Snipe, and you're in a field battle, and your entire army is Bugman Rangers, and you just hide Belagar, you could potentially have your Bugman Ranger units shoot an entire army without them even realizing what's going on. You can have Bugman Rangers climb over the walls without needing artillery, sneak over to the town square, shoot everyone in there without them even knowing what's going on. It's incredibly powerful, but it's still only worth a 9 out of 10 because it does require another unit in order for that to be like as effective as it is. And that being said, I don't think that the Rangers are necessarily the Dwarf's best unit, and he doesn't boost important artillery like organ guns so there's a little bit of room for improvement but it's still a 9 out of 10 is a really solid score for command power and then in terms of faction power Belagar is getting a 10 out of 10 because he does so much for the faction if you get the hammer of Angrind, you get plus three public order all provinces extremely useful uh, you've got rally the holds over here diplomatic relations plus 40 with dwarfs makes confederations easier global recruitment duration minus one for all units really useful for the dwarfs because they can have tons of global recruitment slots because of their rune forges over here so you get that to tier five and you can get extra global recruitment capacity so you can build that in every major settlement right i mean it'll take a little while to do that but you can do it a hero capacity for Thanes. You can un un uh, recruit Thanes in all provinces. And then Age of Reconquest here. Construction time minus 50% for settlement buildings or regions. That's really useful for getting your settlements built up quickly so you can get them walled as quickly as possible. All of this stuff here is extremely useful, which is why he's going to get a faction power of 10 out of 10. And his overall score is going to be 9 out of 10, making him one of the best legendary lords in the game, but falling a little bit short of that coveted 10 out of 10. He didn't quite make it. Um, I guess all dwarves fall a little bit short from expectations here and there. Anyway, that's the dwarf comparison there. Uh, let me know what you think, whether you agree or disagree uh, with this rating. But I appreciate you guys, hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time, fuckers. Bye.